Uh, my name is Brian Fitzpatrick. Most people know me as Fitz. Uh, and my name is Ben Collins Sussman. Most people call me Ben Collins Sussman. And uh, we're here to talk about uh, working with uh, human beings. Uh, a couple little notes. First of all, we're using uh, the experimental service called Speaker Meter so that you can talk all about the show on the Speaker Meter side. As we speak, you can rate us up and down, which is exactly. going to be very exciting. So good or for bad, we would love to hear, hear feedback. But uh, thanks uh, to everyone for coming to this live taping of the Ben and Fitz show. Uh, as all of you hopefully know, we talk a lot about uh, things related to working with uh, people uh, in computer science and software engineering, uh, human beings otherwise known as a giant pile of intermittent bugs. Right. And I, <laughs> Way to put it. Uh, really, the, the probably one of the hardest things that we don't acknowledge about writing software is having to work with other people, right? We study and study how to use our languages and our compilers, and then you get to sitting down to writing software with other people, and you discover that they are in the way as much as the programming language, or perhaps more. Right, well, the social stuff is really hard, right? Yes. It's, it's more squishy, it's a lot less deterministic. I mean, you know, your compiler is incredibly consistent. It's going to do yes. the same thing no matter what kind of garbage you throw at it. Yep. Uh, so, go ahead. But being, but being, if, this is, if you want to be a successful engineer, this is what we tell our friends, we tell our family, if you want to ship software and be really good at engineering, you need to also focus on the social and not just the technical. But it's also key to being an efficient engineer so yes. you don't waste a lot of your energy bickering and arguing and yelling, et cetera, Absolutely. that sort of thing. Well, so well, let's get started here. We're going we're gonna to talk about the, there's four main areas that we're going to focus on in the show today. Uh, and By the, the way, we're not actual doctors. We we're not actual know. doctors. Or chemists of any sort. Okay. Uh, these are just remarkably comfortable, and we think everyone's <laughs> going to be wearing white in the future. Uh, so to, to start off, we have four different areas we're going to talk about. One is, is just general personal behaviors, right? You sort of have to get an idea of how do you like to work? What, what are you good at working with other people? Where are you bad? And that sort of thing. And then we're going to talk about the social dynamics of being on a... Oop, did we lose a mic? We lost a mic? Hello. Hello. Check, check. Hello. Did you turn your mic off? Did I turn my mic off? Okay, talk's over. Thank you for coming. You just talk <laughs> while I wait. Oh, oh hey. there you go. You're back hey, on. Hey, I'm back. Hey, I'm just going to okay. put this here. All just right. Well done. Hi. Okay, number two. Number two, uh, we're going to talk about the social dynamics of being on a team, right? This is how do you interoperate with your team? How do they interoperate with you? And next we're going to talk about how your, op your team operates with outside contributors or folks that work with you that are not in your, in your core team. But may work closely with you. Anyway. But may work close with you, right. exactly. And then finally we're going to talk about how you interact with other people who are not on your team at all, probably your users, right? right. Probably the most important group you need to work with at some point. So we're, we're glad to have all of you here today uh, on this live uh, tape show. We're going to go to the <laughs> phones now and take some calls. Uh, we're going to start with some questions, possibly work with the way that you sort of work with your team uh, uh, or the way you, you sort of used to working, et cetera. Yeah, so. it's like questions about personal behavior. Let's, let's, let's. We, have a, we have a caller. It's, uh, we've got Harlan from Kentucky. Uh, go ahead, Harlan. Hi, I'm Harlan from Greenup. I have an open source project on Google Code, and I want to hide it until it's totally ready to take over the world. How can I do that? Oh, I also need to wipe all the history before revealing it. Can you tell me how to do that? So uh, Harlan wants to hide well, his source code before it's ready, well, until well, it's ready. Well, why, why do you want to, Harlan, why do you want to hide all of your history? All right, well, I don't know. I, I don't want people to see all the screw-ups I made when I was starting out. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> that's understandable, right? You don't want, you don't want sure. people to see a lot of the mistakes you make in that sort and of thing. And we all make mistakes as we work. Um, the problem is it, it, it's easy to take it too far, right? So everyone's a little bit insecure to some degree. Um, and, I, and part of it is the fact that we have this concept in our head of, of people doing miraculous things, right, with in software development. That right. someone like Linus Torvalds just woke up one day and the Linux kernel sprung out of his head, fully formed, right? And I want to be just like that. And so maybe if I, you know, cover up my mistakes, everyone will realize what a genius I am. Right, right. and there's a lot of, of heroes that we have like that, <laughs> right? And, and in reality, these guys, they may be really good, and they may have done something incredible, but they don't, they're mythologized to an extent. They don't necessarily deserve every last bit of the credit that they were given. They do deserve they, a lot of credit. They, they do, do right? absolutely. So, so I would say the thing that you should credit these folks for aren't just, uh, yeah, sure, they started a project. They may not have done the, I've got a funny mic. They may not uh, have done the entire project by themselves, but they actually led a team. They created a team, they right. organized a team, and started something big and coordinated something big until it, it had a huge impact. So right. um, I think the moral here is that you should be thinking about how do you work with a team, not how do I present myself as a genius. Right, right. right. You don't have to hide all your mistakes. Mistakes are okay. Everybody makes mistakes. Uh, let's move to our next caller. We have uh, Dan from Albuquerque. Hi. I've been working on this amazing piece of code for a month and a half, and my coworkers keep 
bugging me to show them what I've got done so far. I totally know they're just going to slow me down. How do I get them to leave me alone so I can code? Okay, so, so he wants, he he wants want to, team to live slow. in a cave yeah. by himself and, and write code and just show up with this sort of finished product. Well, he sounds like he's worried about being slowed down by other people. Right, but if you, you can be making really great progress super fast, but if you're doing the wrong thing, it's, right. it isn't really worth it, right? So if you're working with other folks, you need to sort of have that interaction, that, that, that tight feedback loop, right? When you're, when you're writing code, mm -hmm. you don't write 10,000 lines of code and then hit compile. Does anybody here do that? Because I don't do that. <laughs> no. I don't think you do that. No, you have a, you have a tight feedback loop. Right, you write some code right? and you compile it. You write some code and then you compile it. Sure. Same way with, with your team is you write some code and you get some feedback on, on not just the, the style of what you wrote, but the design of your code. And oh, well, let's start here. The question is, any project needs to be in a tight feedback loop of are you, on the, are you working on the right thing? Are you solving the right problem? Did you make the right choice? If you go too far without getting any feedback, you may wake up and discover you've created something that's redundant or you made a bad design decision that you can't undo. Right. So there's, there's a high risk to working alone for too long. There's also, a, it's a low bus factor, right? If somebody, mm. if this person in the cave gets hit by a bus or a giant rock falls and covers the entrance of the cave, <laughs> You're not gonna. Nobody can pick up that bit of code, right? You know. So, yes. so it's it's. But but more than anything, I think there's just a risk of wasting time. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's one thing to sit down and write a whole bunch of code, but if it's not the right code, it doesn't matter how much you get written, right? Yeah. We should do that. Let's That's take, a good question. Yeah. All right, let's take a new question. We have uh, Bill from Peoria. I was wondering how you guys feel about the uh, social issues implied by the use of midichlorians in Star Wars: The Phantom Menace. Uh, I think. The Phantom Menace? I think there's only three Star Wars movies. Only three Star Wars movies, about. sorry. Um, let's, uh, let, let's take some calls about working with your team here. Stay on topic. Uh, yeah, problems <laughs> with working your teammates, concerns about that sort of thing. Yeah, so, um, all right, okay, we, have, here's one. we got Sarah from Wilmington. Hey there, I love you guys. Uh, we have got a new team lead and he wants us to write a freaking mission statement. What the hell's with that? Can you give me an interview at Google? Well, Google is hiring, yes. Um, yeah. Um, but, uh, so it sounds like she doesn't like the idea of a mission statement. Well, I mean, I mean when, when, you, when most people hear a mission statement, you, know, you think of smarmy, giant, big corporations saying <laughs> stuff like, we're focused on focusing. You we know, empower they, people. We empower people <laughs> to do the things that they do. Or, it, or kumbaya. Yeah. Hold yeah, hands, yeah, exactly. let's have a mission. Yeah. Um, mission statement is actually, I think, really important for a team because it's a way of keeping you, you focused on what you're mm -hmm. doing. It, typically, it's got a direction and a limit, limiter. So we, you know we're going to go this way and we're going to do this, but we're not going to do all these other things. The, the limiter is, is also important, like you say. It's, it's not just about what you're doing. It's also about what you're not doing. Right. That's just as important because it's very easy to sort of have feature creep. Um, and uh, it, it's important. Well, actually, you have a cool story about this, actually. I the, well, when I was helping, I hope, we worked with a lot of different projects at Google to, who were open sourcing. And there was one product about five years ago was going open source, and they actually wanted to do their development in the open. And I talked to them about the importance of a mission statement, and they, the, the team lead was really enthusiastic, and they mm -hmm. got the whole team together uh, to do this. And a lot of people on the team weren't really interested in it, but one of the things that became really obvious quickly is that two of the tech leads in the team actually didn't agree on what the product was doing. And I mean, this isn't like completely unusual here. Oh, but nobody realized they that, They had never right? actually yeah. codified what they were doing and what they weren't doing and working on. And so, you know, y years later, I talked to this guy. I'm like, you know, thanks so much for supporting me when some of your team members weren't excited about this. You know, he's like, well, I thought it was a waste of time, but I figured, what's an hour? You know, we'll give it a try. But <laughs> he, like he said, he discovered really quickly that, that there, this was something that they actually needed to do as a yeah. team uh, to, to be more efficient, to get everybody on the same page. We should point out, it's more, you should do more than just get everybody to agree on what the mission is. You need to document it. Right? If you simply all agree on what something is, and it's not written down anywhere, it's not up on a web page, you will still find other people coming in and arguing with you about it or trying to question what's going on. But if it's on a web page, it's official. It's official, right? right? People get amazed. Oh, it's there on a web page. I guess it's, I guess it's real. Someone, whether it's a new person <laughs> in an open source project or someone coming to join your team, they'll show up and they'll ask a question. You respond by email. Say, well, this is why we do this. They will argue with you for a week. But if you say, it's right on this web page, which is maybe an easily editable wiki for all we know, they'd be like, oh, it's on a web page. Somebody's thought about this. You know, we, maybe we should move it's on. Serious. It's, it's a serious, serious business. Exactly. But you know, this, you'd put it in the same place where you'd put your other documentations, your design decisions, your goals, um, your failures, right? It's yeah. You keep a trail of documentation so people know where you've been and where you're going. Right. Very so documentation, important. important element of communication. Mission Absolutely. statement's not all bad. 
Okay. We have another so, call we have, here. All right, we have, uh, we got Tom from Seattle. Hi guys, this is Tom. I'm thinking about submitting a proposal for Google Summer of Code. I found two projects that look pretty interesting. One is super well known, but I poked around on their mailing list and they were basically all insulting each other and being jerks. The other project is more obscure, but their committers seem pretty cool. Which one do you think I should go for? All right, so he's asking which Summer of Code open source project he should join. Right. Uh, I guess they have some Well, Summer of Code, Google, who, everybody here Google Summer of Code? Everyone? Everybody yeah. knows, right? right? Who has never heard of Summer of Code? It's OK. You can OK, it's it. good. Oh, wow. All right, wow. so Summer of Code, right? That's it's a way for students to flip bits and not burgers in the summer. <laughs> and they get paid to work on open source. That's a huge thing. Um, culture is really important, though, and you can't really expect it to change. Um, yeah, so what you'll find is a lot, and this is not just, not just true in open source, but pretty much in any team in a corporation, you'll find that uh, certain teams are slightly dysfunctional in the way they interoperate with each other, and some are really smooth and everyone respects each other. And you don't see a single team flip-flopping back and forth week to week between those behaviors. They tend to perpetuate. And in fact, I guess you could think of it as um, a culture, just like, I guess, just like a yeast culture. Right, right. right. So we're in San Francisco, <laughs> home of fabulous sourdough bread. Go to any baker that makes sourdough bread and talk to them, how do you make your sourdough bread? The first thing they're going to put in there mm -hmm. is a starter, right? So a starter is yeast and bacteria, right, that happen to get together and do some really awesome stuff for bread. Tastes good. So they take this and then they put it into the new flour and whatnot and they make a loaf of bread out of it. That, that starter culture inoculates this loaf of bread and you get more of what you want as opposed to, you know, the bread just getting taken over by wild yeast and other junk that right. gives bad taste. Yeah, and the culture needs to be strong enough to resist other cultures that may come floating by. Right, right. <laughs> exactly. So what we're saying is that software, devel software developers are a lot like bacteria. Right? Um, no, if but if, what you start with is what, persists, is what you get. Right? So right. if you start a project with a few people who are all very respectful and they trust each other, right, and there, there's some humility, that tends to perpetuate. They tend to attract more people to of the same behavior into the project. And if, if you start a project with people being angry and screaming and one upping each other, that tends to perpetuate as well. Right. You, we, over the long term, you can see projects go from more quiet to more aggressive, but you really see a project go from more aggressive to more peaceful and quiet. Mm -hmm. But so, so beyond that, obviously, I think interest is really important, but you, you, got the, you have to find some style that matches your. Oh, we're answering his question. That's right. So right, <laughs> right. Is yes, um, think about the culture that you want to be part of, not just what project. So if you're okay with the right? big rah-rah rad, rad, fight and, and aggressive culture, then go for that, yeah. right? So, okay. All right, we have another caller here, Re Reginald from Schenectady. Mm. Uh, I just okay. uh, hired a bunch of really good software engineers for my project, but they're not following directions the way I'd hoped. They don't really seem to care about the product. How can I get them to really kick ass? Well, okay, do Reginald, you, do, do they understand the vision and what you're trying to do in your product? Are they excited? Well, we've got a product plan from the sales guys, and I told everyone how important this is. It just, it seems like they're ignoring my orders, no matter how much I yell at them. Oh. How can I get them to listen to me? Well, clearly you need to yell at them more. No, uh, um, the beatings will continue until morale improves, <laughs> right? So, so the problem is, I mean, maybe this is self-evident to a lot of programmers, but maybe not to all managers, is that the way to motivate people is not necessarily to yell at them and bark orders. Right, that, that may be good for factory workers. It may not right. be the greatest thing for knowledge workers. Um, programmers want to have turns. We talk about driving the bus, right? Um, they want to all feel like they get a turn to drive the bus and have a stake in the project and decide where it's going. Um, right, if, you, if, you let them, if you give them the opportunity to drive and not just sit in the bus and do what you, t do what you tell them to do, they're going to do a lot more. You're going to get a lot more out of them. They're going to do some, they could possibly do some amazing stuff that you didn't think of. Right, and so in which case, your role becomes not barking orders, but instead just moving roadblocks so they can drive the bus whatever, for whatever way makes sense most to them. Right. We talk about sort of servant leadership, right, where, where your job as a leader isn't to bark orders and yell at people what to do, but to sort of clear the road, clear the path yeah. to them, help them out, get them what they need to, to get their work done. So, all right, thanks. A lot more to say about that. Well, let's keep going. Let's oh, yeah, right. Ahead. So we'll, we'll take, we have a call from Larry from Hartford. That one guy who was working in a cave before didn't want anyone to bug him. But you told them it's important to work with the team. But surely you can't do that from the start. If he did, he never got off the ground. What kind of hippie free love crap are you guys dishing out here? Well, so he's, he's asking, he's saying if, if we start collaborating from day one, you'll never get anywhere. Right. right? Which, is, which is kind of true. There's an, I mean, if you start too yeah. early, I mean, you, you, can look at, you can look at what? Google Code, GitHub, SourceForge, and there is 
just tons of projects where someone comes out and says, I have this great idea, and then nothing happens. You know, here's, my, here's my readme file describing how I'm going to take over the world, and nobody shows up, right? Or a bunch or, of people show up and want to do a whole bunch of different things. Yeah, and right? they all argue forever, and they never do anything. So, so that's what too early looks like. Well, well, you could go to the other end of the extreme, uh, the other end of the spectrum, which is if you do everything yourself, not only do you have this risk of doing the wrong thing, but if you just sort of reveal to the world something that's mostly done, that's, that's collaborating too late. And nobody wants to get involved, probably because it's done, right? Or, or they, it, there's no chance to make a mark on it. If, or, even if it's not done, it's, it's, so, it's so far uh, past the mark, I guess, that people just are going to come and take your orders. There's not a lot of chance for them to have an effect on what they do. And you see that sometimes with companies that take gigantic products, open source them, throw them over a wall. Nobody comes because it's finished. Right. right? And, Hard, too hard to figure out. So, so I, I think the real answer for Larry is, is design, prototype, then collaborate. That's when you bring other people in because you've got something to, to sort of show and work with and chew on. That's a sweet spot. That's, sort, that's sort of a sweet so spot. So if there is a prototype, sort of a proof of concept, that's enough to show people that it's not vapor and it's still, it's still early enough that people can get involved and feel like they have a stake, but it's late enough yeah. that people aren't going to be arguing about what to do. Right. Wait, and it, it doesn't mean you shouldn't talk to any about it. No. I mean, it, we we talk to talking to friends or something or mm -hmm. getting advice from people. Hey, what do you think about this? And getting feedback is a good thing. But sort of opening the floodgates for for help and collaboration is mm -hmm. what we're talking about there. All right. So our next caller is Chromos from Asjol Arab. Hello? My girlfriend and I have been playing Warcraft for seven years, and for the last couple of raids, things okay. have started to get rocky. I found out from her friend she's been talking about joining another guild, and I'm not sure my 25 men will be able to run anymore. What can I do to patch things up? Is that a Warcraft question? I, I can tell you that the, the Red Dragon Dynasty doesn't do any recruiting at all, except in, in the Realm forums, strictly, and if you see someone doing that, you should contact one of the officers, but... No, not during raid no, times. not during raid yeah, times. Okay. Thanks. All right, so <clears throat> let's try and focus a little more on topic here. Let's go back to the calls on our teams here, please. Uh, now we have, uh, we've got Vern <laughs> from Las Cruces. Long time listener, first time caller. I have a friend um, who has a serious problem. He hasn't told anybody about it yet. Right. What kind of a friend okay, is this? Wait, yeah, tell us more about your friend. Yeah, well, he seems to be writing less code lately and advising my, um, his teammates more and more. It's not like he's their manager, but pe people keep looking to him to fix arguments and decide stuff and give advice and things. Should I get him to see a doctor or something? Well, we only look like doctors. Well, <laughs> you, you, uh, you, I mean, you, your friend, uh, your friend sounds like they're suffering from what we call accidental manager. Yes. Or leadership-itis. So you have this situation right. that anytime you have a group of people working together, even if there's nobody assigned to be the manager or the leader, somebody will fall into that role, whether they like it or not, right? They'll start advising people, resolving Well, it might disputes. not be they'll go kicking and screaming, but they'll see a need and determine sure. that I, I'm the person who's going to step into this, right? It's not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's right. just human nature. Um, there's a power vacuum. Somebody falls into it. And uh, it's scary. If you, if you call that a manager, then programmers get very scared because the word manager is a dirty word, right? right. It's, we, we all think of, we hear the word manager, we think of pointy hair Dilbert characters. Manager is, manager is a scary thing, which is why we like to talk about leaders right. instead of managers, right? People can be leaders without being managers. So, People so can be leaders a, without being, having a title. Right, right. so to answer to Aaron's question, it's actually, it's okay. Oh. Uh, and uh, it's, it's not a bad thing necessarily. No, not at all. All right, so that was good. Let's talk a little more about leadership. Is yeah. there anyone out there who's leading teams that has some questions? Uh, oh, was, uh, Scott, Scott from B Bismarck. Go ahead, Scott. We have a new manager starting next week. I haven't met the guy yet, but I want to get off on the right foot. Do you guys have any tips for me? So the question is how to get off on the right foot with a new manager. Don't, don't, wait, around for, for, don't wait around for orders. Take, basically, I'd say take responsibility. If, if, you're, if your team lead says, you know, I want you to go in and look at a particular tree that's having an issue, don't just deal with that and come back. Go out in the forest and find other, other similar issues and come back and say, look, I found this and this is what I'm going to do. I mean, I think the, the, the worst thing to do is come back and say, what do I do next? Are you saying so? You know? Act like an adult. Act, oh, well, that's crazy. Uh, but if you, if, you, if you come to your manager or your leader and you say, you know, this is what I think I'm doing next, what do you, what do you think about that? As opposed to, what are you going to do? Well, sorry, so there's a proactive right. communication. Right. You should. Don't wait for orders. Proactively pursue some responsibility. Go out and figure out what you think you should be doing. Right. Um, don't just be a yes man. Right. Have some opinions. Express what you really think. 
Tell your manager about your roadblocks. Tell your manager about your successes. Communicate. But, but, yeah, hey, right. communicate. It's, it's like, exactly. It's sort of a, act like an adult. Communicate and you know get your work done. Right. <laughs> there's there's a guy who started working for me a few years ago, and he'd been in the industry for like 20 years at this company. And the first day he comes to me, and it's quarter to five, and he's like, "Look, I, I got to leave early. I had an appointment that I couldn't change. I'm really sorry, but I'll be here late tomorrow. It's no problem." And I said, "Look, man." I don't care when you come and go, as long as you put in your 85 hours a week, you're fine, right? <laughs> and he's like, well, what am I going to do with all my spare time now? Uh, uh, poor guy. But, but, but seriously, it's like, it's like you know, it's, it, it, you don't need to stamp a time clock. You know what your responsibilities are. You know what you need to do. Uh, you know how much you need to do to get it done. Yeah. Act like a grown-up. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have uh, next caller, Lance from Portland. Hi, guys. Just like that other caller, at work we're under a tight deadline. I need people to work faster and longer. I'd even threaten to fire folks if they can't get their performance up. What's wrong with these people? Why aren't they scared? Why aren't they getting more done? So he's threatening to fire people unless Some they get their performance up. Stick. Stick. Shake a giant stick. Right. That doesn't work so well. Especially right. not with not with engineering or not with people. Engineering is a creative thing. I think that right. you know it, it's not just a matter of some some rote activity. It's not. We're not dealing with. Uh, well, I mean, I think managers really came in uh, to prevalence. During the industrial revolution, you've got, right. you know, you, you have your assembly line, you have your your workers who are stuffing cans with meat, and you know, you shake the stick at them, you give them the carrot, etc. You want to get things going more quickly. There's not a lot of right. independent thought there. But if I uh, shake a carrot or a stick at you, you're not going to be smarter necessarily. Or think more creatively. <laughs> think, think more, more creatively, creatively now. <laughs> or right? I fire you. Well, it, you um, need to sort of you need to nurture people, right? I mean, hmm. you really sort of like help them to to again to to get the, their job done. So what am I supposed to do? Coddle them, offer them raises and bonuses to meet their deadline, kick their asses, fluff their pillows. You guys well, are useless. Uh, thank you. Thank you okay. for calling. Well, uh, <clears throat> either um, way, to, I think you need to give people a reason to care. I mean, tell, tell you well, a little bit. So, so there, there's this great guy named Dan Pink who talks on the internet and other places. He talks about, all right, well, here's how, here's how to actually encourage people to be productive in the knowledge industry, right? You should give them autonomy, mastery, and purpose. I love, I love these three things. Autonomy means treat them like a grown-up. Let them do their job the way they want to do it, what makes sense for them. Give them some free reign in making decisions. Right? And trust right. them. Yeah. Right? Mastery means give them a chance to improve themselves and learn new things so they stay engaged and they stay sharp. Right? You don't want to take your sharpest knife and grind right. it in the sidewalk. You want to let, heck, the, let the knife sharpen itself. Yeah. Right? And finally, purpose, meaning you want to let the people actually feel like they have a stake in what they're doing. They have to give them a reason to care. So it's really important to them. I mean, the, to summarize, I think there's no way that you can actually get someone more motivated than they can motivate themselves. So mm -hmm. give them the tools that they need to do that. Intrinsic versus extrinsic right. motivation. Absolutely. That's an excellent question. Yep. OK, we have uh, Todd from Lyle. Go ahead, Todd. I got to say, that last guy seemed like a total jerk. There's a guy on my team who acts like that, too, almost all the time. Wow. How do you guys usually deal with people like that? That's a good question. He's asking, uh, how do we deal with people who are jerks? Well, we see, we see this with people not only in your team, but outside of your team as well. Which right? is a good segue I mean, to the next section, right? Talking about working with people closely who aren't necessarily on your team. Right. Well, I mean, you, you need to protect your culture, right? And, and uh, uh, the most important Thing that your team has is is attention and focus, right? On what you're doing, you're you're here to write software. You're not here to get in a giant yelling contest. Although it's hard because people will push your buttons. You'll want to have these emotional reactions if they're trolling you or they're just being mean in some way. You want to spend a lot of energy fighting back or hurting them back, and it's easy to get carried away. And then you suddenly realize you've wasted your whole day. You're emotionally drained. You've not written any software. It's at all. really hard when it's someone verbally or on an email or whatever attacks you not to fight back, not to sort of. You want to give them that little zinger that puts them in their place and all, but typically that's not going to affect them. They're going to keep going. So it's there's an old Usenet adage. Remember Usenet? There was around about 700 years ago. <laughs> um, don't feed the energy creature, right? And it, yeah. really, I think that's I think that's really important. We we were on an open source project for many years, and a, a rather famous person came to the mailing list and said. Oh, this, this product sucks. It's terrible. What's you wrong suck. with you people? I mean, it was, he was basically there to give a bug report, but the, the email was full of just incredible bile and, and just, just insults. And it, was, it was ridiculous, right? right. And was, I was so proud because um, we, we didn't actually respond. Somebody else in the open source project responded with the most simple, formal language like, oh, looks like you found a bug. Thanks. Uh, can you try doing this instead? Well, we're going to look into it. 
And then, of course, he responds back with just more anger and bile and rah, 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 rah. And, you know, every time somebody else from our community just responds very calmly as if there was nothing wrong. We found the know? bug and yeah. we fixed it. But it's funny because the guy kept looking like more and more of an idiot the more yeah. he responded and the less we responded to the bile. Um, right. Well, we did find the bug. Right. But we did find the bug. Amazing. We fixed it. You know? But had we, if we just tried to argue, we could have easily gone off into mm -hmm. a giant argument with the person. Right? Absolutely. So, all right. That's excellent. All right. Great. We have uh, Mark from Ann Arbor on the line. You guys give this speech before. As, as far as I can tell, it's, it's just a recipe for elitism. You talk about building consensus based teams, but you're just looking for a bunch of pushovers. All you guys want to do is screen out people who disagree with your team. Oh, he's so saying we want to be elitist. Out, he yeah. says. Mm, well, maybe he should go away. <laughs> no, <laughs> no I think, well, I think it's an important <laughs> distinction to make here is we're not talking about throwing the people out or getting rid yeah. of the people. We're talking about addressing the behavior, right? There's, there's a huge difference. There's yeah. a huge difference. I mean, mm -hmm. you, don't, you can actually wind up alienating really good people if you sort of throw the, the baby out with the bathwater. We, we had one guy who was working with us uh, who was okay. really an amazing engineer. Great brilliant, developer, yeah. But he pissed everybody off. He just constantly said things that were insulting. So he'd go along, work, 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 boom, say something, and people would be like, what the heck? Yeah. And so one of us, I think it was you, happened. you pulled yeah. them aside on, on, on chat or something and said, you know, hey, do you realize that when you do this, you're having this effect on the rest of the team? And he was, he was shocked, wasn't he? I think he was surprised. Yeah. But the point was, we, said, we didn't say, get out of here, you're a jerk. We said, please behave in a civil manner. I don't think you realize that you're not being civil. Right. right. And he, he, I don't and think he quite realized it, but he cut back on the behavior and things did smooth out quite a bit. Right. And so that's what I say, even for, like, for people who are moderating mailing lists of any kind of list, right? It's not about who's in and who's out. It's about what kind of behavior is tolerated right. by anybody, whether they're on the list or not. But you, on that same note, you do also have to know when to flip the bozo bit. right? Mm -hmm. You get some people who just don't understand. We did have one guy who wasn't actually writing code, but he's really enthusiastic and really friendly. And he would answer other people's <laughs> questions all the time incorrectly. He okay. would also just sort of free associate in the mailing list. Hey, yeah, you ever like, think about putting this in? It was like his stream yeah. of consciousness kind of kept emailing the list every hour. We should put a list of it, Star yeah. Trek reruns in the documentation. <laughs> You're like, what? And you know, we, we actually talked to him a couple times about it, and he didn't quite get it. And we finally sort of said, look, you need to stop doing all this stuff. And he really didn't understand. But he did agree to actually stop posting about all this. Yeah. Uh, so it was, that was sort of one of the harder things, right? But Well, I think what that proves is that there can be people who are disrupting your team's attention and focus who are not trolls, who are the nicest people in the world, right? right. Um, it could be some, like for example, one example is just people who are perfectionists don't realize they're being perfectionist. And they can actually drain all of the attention and energy by never letting anybody start because the, the design doc's not perfect yet, yeah. right? So that's, that's an example. But, but I mean, to turn all this around into a different way of looking at it, it's, mm. it's really healthy and important to have a good team ego as opposed to individual egos. I know that's the Apache Software Foundation. Right, Apache is about building communities. If anyone has ever looked through a lot of the Apache code, you, you rarely find someone's name at the top of a file. This is a practice that is very contentious. It's almost as contentious as VI versus Emacs. Or, how many people here use VI? Anyone? Anyone? How about Emacs? All right, fight. Yeah. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. The, uh, <laughs> The, 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 this one guy who came to our product who wrote a whole date parser module. It was a pile of code. It was actually it was great. pretty well written. When we went through and gave him the code review, we said, look, you know, here's our style guide. You did great, this, this, but take your name out of the top of the file. It's not any, we don't have anyone's names in the source code. It's just, it's just project policy. It's just product. We have other ways of acknowledging yeah. people helped out. And you know, he's like, oh, no, I wrote this code. I'm putting my name on it. And you know, we went back and forth with him trying to explain, look, this isn't about trying to take away credit. But I mean, it, it's, where, it's really hard. Where does it stop, right? right? I wrote three lines of code. Do I get my name in there? You wrote 10 lines of code. But I rewrote them. Or what if I delete some code? Does I mean fixed the a bug. Does my out? name go in there? You know, it's, it, there's just, it's just a lot of wasted energy, right? There's other ways to recognize people. You do want to recognize people. It's very important. It's a way of increasing intrinsic motivation, mm -hmm. I would argue. Mm -hmm. uh, but we wound up not taking this guy's code, and he went away. Uh, just sad. It's just but, sad. But it's also one of those cases where it was more important to preserve the culture than to accept this one particular contribution. Right. Right. Yeah, excellent. All right. Good. Let's, good. Uh, we've got uh, Norman, Norman from uh, Winnetka. All right. I, I've been a long time listener. Click and clack. You guys do just an absolutely amazing job. Long time fan. Uh, anyway, I've got this Codless Supreme. It's an 84. Uh, yeah, so anyway, the transmission Wait. makes this nom, 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 nom. And I've tried to fill it with sawdust, but I just don't know what to do about it. Uh, um, well, have, you, have you tried rebooting it? <laughs> um, 
that fixes a lot of problems. I think it's the uh, wrong number. Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's go back to working. Let's talk about let's move on to uh, people who work with your product, right? As opposed to not ah, your people on your team. Users. Okay. Yeah. Take a couple calls from. Uh, oh, so we have Carl from Kansas Hi. City. Uh, I've been listening forever. I'm on an open source project, and it's been doing really well. And lately, a bunch of industry analysts have been asking us for white papers and bugging us for interviews and things. Everything, everything about our software is up on the website, clearly, and the mailing list is archived and everything. But these analysts and reporters and these guys just don't get it. How do we get them to stop bugging us and read the same docs as everybody else? Have you ever had to deal with these kind of people? So the question is about how to deal with uh, industry analysts. Um, do yeah. they wear white coats? They don't. <laughs> um, but they do expect you to do a lot of work for them. Uh, and, I mean, I was, so I was, yeah. I was VP of, of, mm. uh, pres of um, public relations for Apache for a while. And we would get analysts who would show up and say, hey, you know, we're, we're going to do this enterprise report on blah, blah, blah software. Can you give us this, 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 and this? Because they're used to going to big companies and say, give us all this stuff. And people, yes, yeah, so right away, here it is. Can I get you a cup of coffee with that? Uh, because they want them to write good things. And engineers, thinking very logically, think, well, this jackass should go read the documentation. Just like everyone else. It's all answered yeah. in the mailing list somewhere. Go search for it. Right? That yeah. doesn't fly so well. Well, well pro programmers don't like anything to do with marketing, I think. In general, they distrust marketers. How many people they here love marketing? <laughs> Other than the marketer. Yeah, no, right. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. Who's not a marketer? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but the, the point is, is that I, I think perception is important. Perception, I would say, I like to say perception is nine tenths of the law. You can have a great Absolutely. piece of software if people don't know about it. If you don't shine it up a little bit, mm -hmm. people aren't go, you're not going to do as well as you could have. I think it's also, so. a lot of folks don't realize that it's, it's possible to do marketing without being slimy. I mean, it's not. No. I know it's possible. It's possible. I mean, you, could, you can under-promise and over-deliver. Make that your policy. So if you've got substance, it's OK mm -hmm. to do some shine. I think, I think mm -hmm. where it comes into problems is that people expect that you, just, you get a lot of shine, right? A lot <laughs> All of shine, right. no product. Uh, so I think, what's the answer to the question? I think the answer is. Uh, the answer play the, the game a little. Right? Play the game a little bit. I don't think yeah. you have to really like you know fall over to do everything for them, but you do yeah. need to. I, I think play a little bit along. Don't there. discount it completely. Right. Right. Mm. All right. So our, our next caller is Connor from uh, from Gallifrey. Go ahead, Connor. My company has the email addresses of all our customers. We got those mainly so we could send out license keys. We promised not to spam our users, but now some of our marketing guys are begging to email the customers with. They call it occasional product updates. I don't mm -hmm. think it's worth pissing our users <laughs> off for a quick bump in sales. What's your take on this? So, so the question is, is it, is it worth getting a bump in sales to uh, spam the users, I guess? No. It sounds like spam Next question. Me. No. Um, <laughs> this is tricky. It's about trust, really. I mean, this trust. is about trust. And, and it, it's interesting because we're in a different place than we were 15 years ago, thank God. Mm. Um, Nowadays, if people, for, in the software world, it's really easy to switch and try other software. People come to you, they can use your software easily, they can just as easily try someone else's. And so having a trust, a reputation, your company's reputation, how much people trust you is really, really important. Right. And it's, and it's dangerous, right? Because we always say trust is like a bank account. You can spend years building up trust with your users. But one night in Vegas, it's all That's gone. Right. <laughs> right? And you blow it all. You blow all the trust at once. It's, it's, it's very scary. Um, and, and doing things like sending spam, it's a slippery slope. It's yeah. a way to blow your trust right away. Um, well, I see, I have an example. My grandfather managed a Firestone tire store for 35 years. Yeah. How many people in this room own a car? Hands up, leave your hands yeah. up. How many people own a car and have a mechanic that you trust? Yeah. Wow, that's got to be <laughs> nine people with their hands up in the room, okay? That's Why an, is that? That's an ex what? that's an example. I think mechanic is mechanics are typically an industry where people they take advantage of you. You go in with a flat tire and oh, you need to, your flux capacitor is a little bit too slow, and you know yeah. you're going to do a complete radiator flush and yeah. uh, fluids uh, check. And they, don't they forget call it the, mailboxing. Right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of selling people other things. <clears throat> My grandfather for 35 years he took over the store, and when he took it over, it was the it lost more money than any other store in Louisiana, and within three years it was the number one grossing store. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the state. And that wasn't just because yeah. uh, they did great stuff. It was because he didn't <laughs> try and rip people off. 95% of his Trust. business was returned. It, it came back. It very quickly mm -hmm. paid for itself. There's no real point to doing it. But short term benefits, but in the long term, it's going to kill you. So but getting back to the question, right? Trust. How do you, Important. I mean, clearly, this, this guy's company, they want to connect to their users. There's other ways to do it besides sending product updates unsolicited. Wait, right? wait. Really? I know it's possible. You can have a relationship with the users that isn't just spam. Um, for example, you can talk to them. 
directly. Like, no. I know, I know, it's crazy. Uh, you can listen to them. Give them an outlet to communicate. For example, put up a public bug tracker. Um, we've got social media now, right, where you can communicate updates. You can read what they're saying back about you in social media, right? You see this um, with a lot of startups, actually. A, a lot of really successful startups that have user-facing products, they are in the trenches every day, helping their users, supporting them, answering mm -hmm. their questions, listening to their feedback, and implementing features they based on that. They love to be heard. It's, it, <laughs> Even if you can't People love them. to be heard. And it's, I mean, I, I know that I like to be heard when I'm using a piece of software. So <laughs> I, what it, to, to answer the question, is it OK to spam customers like that, I think you're going to get a bump from it in sales. It's going to be a short-term thing, and I think it'll hurt you in the long term. Absolutely. So, okay. Let's do another call. Let's get another call. We have Bill from Santa Monica. My company does listen to users, and they're always asking totally obvious questions in our forums. Half the time, they're unable to explain their problem, so it's almost impossible to help them. So well, he's saying he's having trouble understanding users yeah. when they do talk to him. I, 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 well, it's I a skill, a little. right? I yeah. Mean, yeah. Um, it's, for example, I mean, learning to talk to non-techies is a skill, right? I mean, I feel like probably everybody in this room talks to their parents at some point or a relative on the phone. Who does to tech support for your parents? Tech support phone, for your family, right? right? Yeah. And you're on the phone and you're trying to understand what the heck they're talking about because they're using language you don't understand and vice versa. And so it becomes the skill you cultivate where you, you try to read what, what, what they mean, not what they say. Right. Right. You have to translate um. intentions. <laughs> it's it's okay. really the 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 most Thinking extreme your, example I have. Your of grandmother, this, right? My grandmother. Yeah. Okay. My my grandmother. I love her to death. We're sitting down one day talking, and she asked about my grand my grandfather who died years ago. Asked about his computer. Is that computer still worth anything? And it's like a Mac Classic, right? You know. <laughs> and I said, Well, no, not really. She said, Oh, okay. You know, I only ever turn it on when I have to sharpen a pencil. Oh yeah. And I'm like, wait, wait. You know, I know I'm going to regret something hunting this down, but I got to figure this out. So it turns out that the computer is plugged into a power strip. And there's also a pencil sharpener plugged into this power strip. So every Saturday, she goes in there with her three pencils, turns the computer switch on, a little Mac goes beep and starts whirring up slowly. She sharpens the pencils and boom, kills it. <laughs> Once a week, every week. Poor Mac, <laughs> never. Finished. You'll be. I assure you, I, I liberated the computer quickly. It's safe. Did you uh, put it out of sound. its misery. I put it out of its misery. <laughs> but I mean, talk about like, holy cow! What is what is this? What are they thinking, right? And so I think it's really important to make an effort, and it's it's a learned skill. You can actually cultivate mm -hmm. that. Uh, and the people who do it, I think, full time, you should win some sort develop of developer relations people. Man, that's Absolutely. that's some of the hardest work, right? Not just developer relations, like customer anyway, relations. Anyway, customer right? relations. Absolutely. I, mean, I think developers typically understand more. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah, you're right. Okay, uh, that is it. Thank you all for uh, coming to this live taping of our show. We'll uh, switch over to live Q&A in just a second, but that's all live we have for today. Thank Great. you. We have microphones if you have questions. Questions. If you, if you do have a question, please step up to the microphone and ask it so we can all hear you. Uh-oh. Or maybe no questions at all? Or maybe not. Anyone? We scared we'll everyone away? Have we answered all your questions already? Maybe they don't want to be in the air. No? <laughs> this part isn't taped, I don't believe, anyway. So, all right, first question. Uh, you can go right ahead. Whoa, no. Wait. Speak a little more slowly. That? Sorry about that. <laughs> go ahead. It's not on? It should be on. Check. I don't think so. There it is. Oh, hey, good. There we go. So, um, I'm starting a project right now, and my business and my IT aren't just talking. I'm the developer. How do I drive that discussion so we can develop requirements and actually get this project off the ground? So business and IT aren't talking, you said? No. That's right. Business wants everything. IT needs to limit that. How do I get those two teams to talk so that I don't have to be in the middle? <laughs> that's a hard problem. That's, wow, that's, um, that's a really hard problem. I think we need to know and, what, they're, what they're arguing over. To, to be able to answer that well, better. Well, I mean, um, I've seen this before where business, like, you know, we need everything and we need it today, right? And tech, you're like, well, we can only give you so much. And yeah. then and there's, there's, a, there's a big disconnect there. So mm -hmm. I think the hardest thing to do is getting someone who has actually the power in the company to drive that conversation. You can't drive the conversation if you're just sort of an observer or not somebody who's actually, you know, running one, side, one team or the other. This so. is a case where you, you need a decision maker who can bridge the gap. Right. right. I mean, I think some things can't be entirely uh, fixed through through discussion. But if you can't find if you can't find help for that, I I would say that that's I I don't see you going anywhere soon, except for <laughs> you know the wrong way. Yeah. Thanks. Another question. Next question. Yeah. Um, yeah. A company that I've uh, been working for lately, uh, they'll put out uh, about a new final 
a uh, set of requirements every few days. <laughs> and it's just uh, super frustrating. So can you give any advice about how to kind of cope with that or changing? With so the question's about how to deal with con constantly changing requirements. Um, I, I, like to, I like to deal with that by or, organizing, right? Yeah. If, if you, let's say, so as, as an engineering team, if you've got a roadmap that goes out for a year for your product, which I know it's hard to really predict anything past three or four months, but if you've got this roadmap and the team comes back the next day and they say, okay, we need you to do all this stuff, you could sit down and say, okay, look, we can add this, this, and this, but all this other stuff's going to have to move back because we can't so fold them. space and time. Yep. Right? So that's, that's a really good strategy is, is to out-organize them. Okay, and then when they come back, you can just sort of very plainly point out, that's fine, I'm glad to do this. And then suddenly they're the bad guys, right? They have to think of it as, yeah. oh, well, I don't want you to get rid of that. Well, like, look, I've only got six more, six guys. Right, you know? so I guess the difference there is you're, you're not just saying yes to everything, right? Or no. Or no, you are, you are making it extremely clear what the trade-offs are. With data. Every time, with data, with yeah. data. Nothing scares people like data. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, sure. oh, should we take a question from over oh, here? Oh, over here, please. I wanted to know what your thoughts were on uh, continuous deployment, the idea when you check in some code, you're going to run some automated tests, but without no human intervention, just put it live on your website. Who should use it and who shouldn't? Oh, that scares the crap out of me. No, I can't. I mean, so the question is <laughs> about when is continuous deployment a good thing? I think it's fantastic. Right? We use it at Google. Depends on what it we is. Well, all right. So when are the downsides of using continuous deployment? You could blow yourself up. Well, you could also spend a lot of time getting it to work. That's, that's my personal experience is that it's a big time investment up front but it saves a huge amount of time in the long term. And so you have to make, I would say it's, it has, it's an investment of short versus long term time. And are you willing to make that investment? I think it's appropriate for everyone if they're willing to make that trade off. If they have the luxury of making that initial investment. Right, that's, and, that's but another, and another way of doing that is to, you know, is to have things go out into test servers and then move on. Or if you're running multiple servers, you can check it out on one, et cetera. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a lot of different ways of doing that. Hmm. Cool. Over here, yes. Uh, we have a new developer on our team who uh, is we're part of an extremely large software project, and he uh, kind of jumped in head first and has been making a lot of changes um, without, I think, really understanding, and it's kind of introduced a lot of bugs. And I tried to point this out to him, and um, the problem is he's uh, almost 25 years older than me. You know, I'm only 23, so he has kind of this attitude of, this is how I've always done things, and who are you to tell me that I should or shouldn't do this? So how can I approach you know, him and talk this without sort of it becoming a defensive you know, because I, I have more experience in the project and the code. Sure. Well, he may have yeah. more experience professionally, long term. How many people in the team? Is it just I you would say him? developers. No, uh, five to ten. Five to ten. Yeah, so this is a case of cultural invasion, right? right. In some way, yeah. right? If it, does your team have a strong culture of yeah. code well, review oh, yeah. or well, not this a, is how we do not things? Of, of code okay. review, but you know. But is it a culture of, of specific development practices that you all adhere to, all ten of you? Is it, we try to. Exist? <laughs> do, you, right. do you have any of it documented by chance? I mean, well, this is I mean, where... Fortunately, it's an extremely large software project that's grown over about 10 years. Yeah. So there are piece, you know, people, he understands this part really well, and I understand this part, my part, really well. So when he kind of comes in and, you know, makes changes to my part that I spent a long time working on, and it introduces problems, and when I try to talk to him about it, he doesn't really, you know, I guess would say it doesn't give me the respect of, like, having, you know, of, of being someone who's on the same level sure. as him. Even though I have more... A lot longer experience in the actual and what we're working on. Well, I think, I think more than anything, it sounds like a cultural, mm -hmm. again, well, a cultural invasion. Well, it's, it's not about disrespecting you. It just sounds like he's not paying attention to the culture mm -hmm. overall. And so I would, I would argue this is a case where multiple people point this out to him. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, perhaps a manager or someone to say, look, it's not just this one young guy who's, who's trying to get in your way. And it's, You're actually disrupting the whole team. And mm -hmm. it's not just the, mo the job of the, of the manager, the team, to do that. I would say mm -hmm. it's the job of the whole team when it's four or five people who are telling him all this and he mm -hmm. hears it from everyone, it's, it's one thing. Uh, but also, again, I'd say documentation. If you had your culture, I'm not saying the product, but your culture document. Processes. We do this, we write a design doc, mm -hmm. and then we get an approval on that, and then we move along, et cetera. That, I, I would say, argue is pretty important. But get, get more people involved, mm -hmm. so it's not just about you and him. Yeah. It's about him and the whole team realizing that he's sort of going against the grain of everybody. Right? And then, it, then it's not about personal conflicts. Mm -hmm. It's about just everybody agreeing on what the process is. Yeah. Next question, please. Okay, so I read about the, uh, this developer that actually pulled his app from the Android market because he kept noticing only the bad reviews uh, people gave him. Uh, <laughs> even though supposedly the app was great and it worked great on many, many phones, but still really bad, bad reviews kept uh, you know, creeping up to the top. And so he just couldn't take it. Uh, so he took, took the free- Was it a bad app? No, it was, uh, supposedly it was a really good app. 
competitors uh, troll? So, uh, how, what are your, your thoughts, uh, thoughts on that? How, how, how can a team cope with a team that is, uh, well, probably emotionally tied to a product they just made and made available for free, and then, you know, you keep getting these bad reviews? I'm asking because it might happen to me if I put out a product for free and then, you know, keep <laughs> well, getting better reviews. I guess I think there's two parts to this answer. You are not your code? Well, yeah, you're, you're, you're not your code. I mean, you've got to be ready for, you know, Ben and I worked on Subversion years ago, right? Sorry about Sorry. that. Yeah. Um, they, <laughs> we, we've gotten past, and people are like, you know, like we, we've actually, we'll joke was we use Mercurial. I'm like, oh, yeah, whatever, with Subversion. And like, somebody's like, how can you talk bad about your product? You know, and we're like, you know, you've got, you got to learn how to, let go? Let go, right? I mean, and yeah. move along. So I would say, first of all, is that you're not your code. But second of all, some of those maybe if they're legitimate, you really got to look to see, is there legitimate complaints there? If it's just people trolling or griefing or, or you know, just people complaining it's just or whatever. Noise, right? It's just noise. I mean, if it's really, if it really is a great product, I think you'll get more good reviews than you will uh, bad reviews. But if there really are legitimate bad reviews, you've got to be, get a look, look for constructive criticism. Constructive criticism is, in my opinion, it's gold. Gold, right, yeah. and that's why actually we should move along to this. That's why actually I'm a huge fan of like getting feedback. Okay, so back to, yes. to the speaker meter thing. Constructive. Um, getting constructive criticism is a way for us to improve and get better. We gave this talk a couple weeks ago, and we asked people, you know, what can we do better? And I think we learned some things, and I'm hoping that we'll get some more feedback today that we'll learn. So that's what I, would I was going to say. The other the other wisdom is you know, like in, in terms of dealing with trolls or people who are just criticizing for no reason. Right? What was that saying about the internet is full of crazy people? Or the world is full the of crazy people? The world is full of crazy, crazy people, people. It, but the internet, it's like they all live right next door. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. so you just have to learn to ignore the noise. I mean, there's just, that's just how the internet is. Now, the, the first thing I recommend to people who are working in open source is go buy a rhinoceros skin and wear it for a while. You know? <laughs> Thicken your skin as much as you can. Yeah. Uh, to go along the same vein as the previous question with the younger developer and the new, and the, and the new older guy coming in, I am the new younger guy coming in, and so to me, a lot of the management types are sort of gray beard tech guys. They grew up on Visual hey, hey, Basic. Hey, be careful there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and so to them, I'm a maverick. To me, they're dinosaurs, and so there's a little bit of, you know, headbutting with new tech. I want to do things, do it live, you know, document it, and send it out. They want to test it for two weeks, see what happens, stuff like that. Uh, what do you guys recommend? Sounds like a culture conflict. Again, another I mean, culture conflict. Well, here's the biggest question. Is there respect going both ways? Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. Then I think you are, you are, this is a resolvable issue, right? If people have humility and respect and there's some mutual trust, then it sounds like it's something you can work out. But again, it sounds like this is a case where people need to sit down and talk about, well, what should our processes be, yeah. right? And if you want to change the culture, that's fine, but you should, you should be able to have a discussion about that um, and, and not just have a series of conflicts over it, right? I think. But it's hard, it's hard sometimes. It's, One of the interesting things about documenting why you do things is mm -hmm. if you can go into a little bit of detail in some cases, you can show there's, there's often a lot of reason and wisdom behind some choices, decisions mm -hmm. that may seem non-obvious or archaic. And, but if you can dig in and be like, oh, that's why we do that. Or, you know, oh, maybe it's because something really bad happened in the past here. We're, gonna, well, we're, we're guarding a little more carefully and trying to avoid risk. So, so it sounds like you're recommending research of the existing culture right. before deciding to overturn it. Yes, right? exactly. And, and try, really try and understand. I mean, that's one of the biggest things to do when you're having a disagreement with somebody is if you can really, really, really strive to understand what their point of view is, um, especially if you're married, <laughs> um, <laughs> then it's, it's, it makes it a lot easier to, I think, carry that conversation. The more you listen, the more you are listened to. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, so thank so you. Just yeah, to follow up on that. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Um, unfortunately, it's a, it was a small company. It's a startup. And so a lot of that apocryphal wisdom about why uh, we don't reboot the server on Wednesday morning, for yeah. example, it's just not anywhere. And so it comes to me, actually, to document that stuff. So there's, there's a good sort of feedback, learning, getting it all committed to right. digital ink, so to speak. Well, it sounds so. like you got an opportunity to, to drive the bus a bit there. So that's good. Definitely, yes. So, all right, excellent. Thanks, Thank you. Guys. Next question. You guys spoke about some specific tools to define your culture, like documentation, the code itself. Are there any other tools that you use on a regular basis to kind of define your culture? Wikis? Well, Wearing documentation. lab coats. Yeah. <laughs> no. No. Uh, no, I mean, I think documentation, but just sort of, I think cultures, there's a lot of different stuff in culture. We focus a lot on the social aspects of it, of interacting. Like, I, I know some teams, it's like 
4.30 on Friday, you know, everybody sits around and has a couple beers, right? Um, Nerf guns. Nerf guns, right? <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's a team in Pittsburgh, Google, they, they, they used to be right next to a train. Like, it was so loud you couldn't even think. When it, the train would go by, everybody would jump up and shoot each other with Nerf guns, right? <laughs> go back to work. That was kind of cool. <laughs> it was, it was kind of fun. There's a lot of different things you could do, like, like eating okay. lunch together, right? You know, I mean, Google's sort of known for having free food. Right? There is an incredible benefit by getting your team to eat lunch together and not necessarily talk about work. Right? Mm. You suddenly realize that this guy who I strongly disagree with for programming thing, some programming issues is, is a human, right? He's, mm -hmm. he's married, he's got kids, he's a nice guy. Wow, you know? And it really helps. It, it, takes, it makes it a lot easier for you to have these hard discussions and, and accept uh, constructive criticism, that sort of thing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So over here. Yes, please. Um, attention on details. I mean, how do you get people to like really focus on attention on details? It's not just you give them a, like, a visual spec and they give you like, a very basic of what you have give them such as round corners, drop shadow, like type of thing. So you're talking about attention to details in, in the software. Mm -hmm. How do we get developers to pay attention to details? Um, are, are you having a particular problem with certain developers just being sloppy? Or um, it's not being it... sloppy, it's just like being very like basic. Hmm. It's just like whatever you give them, just whatever, you, like you give them a, a, a mock-up and then the product come back exactly as a mock-up. I mean, because these... <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like... Sounds like people are simply not meeting job expectations in that case, right? I mean, there's a, well, there's a lot of different things tricky. that could be wrong with that. I think, uh, you know, it, it it is tricky, but I think communicating more about expectations. I mean, flat out, there, there's a lot of cases I know where people had someone that worked with them or worked for them who wasn't meeting expectations, and they don't say anything because they don't want to rock the boat. And that's exactly when you should be rocking the boat. When you're most afraid. To when do you're it. most <laughs> afraid to rock, to, like boom, that's when you start communicating. If you just Flat out say, look, this is what I expect of you, and this is what I'm not getting. And I here really are two or three this. examples of where I expected two something Two examples different. minimum. At least two. At least two. Give them hard data. Say, I expected X, Y, and Z, and you gave me this other thing, and you did it two or three times, so we're going to have to either You can at least be sure in that it, case or, that yeah. they know it. Yeah. Because quite frankly, they might not know it, right? So I would say communication there it's is a communication pretty, problem. pretty important. Yeah. yeah. We could take two more questions. <clears throat> Hi. Um, a while ago, uh, you talked about the um, ethical issues of, uh, for instance, spamming people and whatnot. And um, what would what would be the right thing to do uh, when the general culture of the place uh, seems to be um, skewed toward that direction? And um, you did uh, mention um, that that would um, cause financial uh, damage in the long run. But I am not the bean counter. I'm just the engineer, and I. I doubt that would be uh, persuasive from my part. Well, that sounds more like a question of how do we, how does one engineer change an entire culture? That's of a that's company. Really, that's a really hard, it's a really problem. hard problem. <laughs> we right? get this question a lot, yeah. actually, and our, our our answer is usually find a new company. Well, no, <laughs> or, no, no, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> that's not our, our first answer. That's is, our, yeah, that's is that right. you can make attempts to this, right? Right. It, Try to change what you what you can and, and look into it. Make attempts to, to ask people about it. If you thought about it this way, but um, yeah, if if you try and and, and you're not successful, you can just sit there and stew about it. You can learn to deal with it, or you can get the heck out. Well, you can actually I mean, build. So I find also reaching out to other people in the company who feel the same way. You can start to sort of build a movement within the company. I mean, it's it's politics, right? But you can actually form a movement within your company so that there's a, there's a single voice saying, "We don't like this. We think we should change this." And the louder you become, the more the dialogue is likely to happen. But, but do keep in mind that companies aren't democracies. They're not democracies. Right. So if you but know, you can still have political movements within them. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Alice's restaurant. Go ahead. I work on a team uh, where there's another guy who's a very capable developer, but he often holds his cards real close to his vest. Doesn't you know share things with the rest of the team often. And furthermore, uh, my boss looks upon him with great favor. Um, do you guys have any tips or strategies that you might suggest uh, for dealing with both him and, and my boss? Well, what's, 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 what's wrong with him holding close to his chest? That he's not sharing or he's not... Right, that, that oftentimes he won't engage others, other members of the team or um, uh, oftentimes he'll uh, maybe uh, uh, get that super special assignment or whatever, you know, before others are considered, that sort of thing. Interesting. That's, um, that's another hard problem. I mean, again, you can, you can, you can give them data. Like, you know, if, if I would say with the, your boss in particular, if we got more information, we could do more. But that's, that tends to be one of the things that's really hard to change. Again, that, if that, you can quantify the impact right. of him 
not collaborating with people, then, it's, then you have an argument to make saying, well, we should get him to open up. I, mean, that's, I guess that's an argument to the manager, right? Or maybe right. to other members of the team. But if the manager and the lead both think this is the way we're going to run things, you know, you, you don't mm -hmm. have much of a choice, again, uh, a, a way to change that. It's really hard. Because yeah. uh, they're defining the culture top down, and you're just sort of following along. Right. right? Um, so. I would also, I would, if, if I were on the team, I would also try to look and figure out the psychology of this person. Are they just insecure? Mm -hmm. Or are they egotistical? Are they, you know, what's, what's, what's going on, right? And how do you get them to open up? And, and there may be just social routes, I mean, social engineering to just get in there and get them to open up and figure out what's really going on. Yeah, right? sure. All right, uh, thank you. All right, thank you all for coming. Thank you. I appreciate it. We'll be around for a bit to talk a little more after this. Okay.